Hello, dear friends, and welcome to the Geo Coast. Um, today I'm meeting Commander Tom Tuhi, uh, with whom I had the pleasure to work on the same naval base a few years ago yep. and who served in the Navy for 36 years. Hello, Tom. Pleasure to meet you again, Max. Um, so, as I know, like you, you've been in the Navy for 36 years, from 1973 to 2010. So, tell me what made you join the Navy? Why did you choose to connect your life with the sea? Um, because I was born and reared in Winniskiri, so I was very familiar with the, the Navy. Mm. And um, it was something I always wanted to do. So in December 73, the 13th Naval Cadet class, comprising of four people, joined the Navy. And um, in January 74, then we commenced our training. At that stage, the Navy was very small, so just a little over 400. So the facilities weren't there to train cadets. So the training was conducted in... Uh, Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth, mm -hmm. in Devon in the UK, on a fee-paying basis. So the initial training was a one-year midshipman's course, and then you came back to the naval base here mm -hmm. in Cork, and you did your sea time, and then you were commissioned, and then went back to the UK to do a nine-month specialist course, specialising in gunnery, in communications, mm -hmm. anti-submarine warfare, all big ship navy stuff. And uh, you were back in Ireland, did your watchkeeping course, which allowed you to be an officer to watch on board ship, mm -hmm. and then on your, your career commences. Okay, and did you have a dilemma when choosing your career? Did you have options, like did you, maybe you were thinking about joining the Merchant Navy? Or? No, no, my, my draw was always to join the Irish Navy, okay. um, because I was so familiar with it growing up. Did you have any relations serving in the Navy? I had an uncle. Okay. And as a child, were you allowed to visit the naval base? Yes, yeah, we frequently go over the bridge because um, the nearest uh, national school to us was Hallbowl National School mm -hmm. and the Ringskiddy and Hallbowl National Schools would meet quite frequently. What were the most memorable, exciting events in your 36 years of serving mm -hmm. in the Navy? Can... <laughs> There's plenty. <laughs> um, I suppose your, your first ship, um, your first mm -hmm. command, which uh, was? Uh, was Ellie Orla, uh, commissioned her into the Navy in 1989 and um, there was five officers on board and it was this quite a small wardroom and we meet every year since 1989 mm -hmm. and all, we're all retired now from the Navy obviously. And in your years being in the Navy, which naval ships have you served on? Um, I, well I, I initially started off on the minesweepers, they were coastal minesweepers, mm -hmm. uh, the Gronia, the Bamba and the Fola and I spent time on all those three ships as a young officer and then I went on to be second in command of the flagship the Elietna and then I took my own command on the Orla uh, followed by command of the Deirdre and followed very daily on because of the NMCI project command of the flagship the Etna. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that all names of the Irish naval vessels they're female names. Yeah? Uh, the, last, the last batch of vessels aren't female they're named after ports. Mm -hmm. After ports? Ports. Poets, what, what is that? They're people who write poetry and, and right, poets, authors. Poets, yeah. Okay, yeah. So that's the but, Shaw, but the, okay. the Beckett, uh -huh. the Joyce, uh, that, that class and, of and, But still, like, there are a lot of names which kind of would be kind of female names. Is it part of tradition? It is was it a tradition like, up to the last batch, um, the P60 class, to name them after the Celtic goddesses. Uh -huh. So they all would have a history back in Celtic mythology. And wh where this tradition came from? Um, the first three ships uh, in, after the Second World War were called the Cleated Maven and Mocha. It was decided then that they would name them after Celtic goddesses. Okay. And the tradition just lived on. During your time in the Navy, Tom, have you been on any overseas mission? Um, yes. Um, on the Deirdre, we went to Kiel in, in Germany for a week. It's called Kiel Mocha. It's a big regatta, mm -hmm. for a naval regatta. Um, on the Etna, uh, I took her over to uh, North America. Uh, into the Great Lakes, down to uh, Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, Montreal, and St. John's in Newfoundland. And uh, also on the Etna, we went to Bordeaux. Um, naval ships initially didn't go abroad, but more recently they have been going abroad as, mm -hmm. far, as far as Tokyo, uh, around oh. South America. So, the, the, you know, it's not a big issue anymore, traveling abroad. So, but you didn't have to take part in any war conflicts? Uh, no, no. Um, as part of, of our commitment to the UN, you do, um, you do some UN service, mm -hmm. and I did my service in the Middle East, um, 
initially in Tiberias in northern Israel, but most of the time was spent in Damascus. Mm -hmm. It's like peacekeeping. Uh, it, yeah, because technically uh, Syria and Israel are still at war, they're only on ceasefire. Mm -hmm. So you're monitoring the ceasefire line. So I was working out of Damascus, um, working with the Syrian army. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so it wasn't on board Irish vessel? It, no, no, it no, it's a UN service, okay. yeah, yeah. And that was a two-year mission, but you could bring your family, which was very enjoyable. <laughs> what, what would you want to yeah, say? Yeah. We're personally involved in many military operations in Irish waters, maybe like CGO of drugs or something. Oh, like God, that. yes, yeah. Um, uh, particularly on the Deirdre, we, we had a, a controlled delivery of about 300 million worth of cocaine. Um, sometimes you, you go and uh, intercept the vessel, mm -hmm. um, but other times the police prefer the, what they call a controlled delivery. What is that? Where, is it, where you track the vessel. And the pirate vessel. Yeah, the vessel bring the illicit cargo. And then once it lands ashore, it's tracked as well because they want to get to see who the owners of mm -hmm. the illicit cargo is. Yes. So um, that, was, that was probably the biggest drug one. But there was a lot of missions that, that you do that don't hit the papers, mm -hmm. um, tracking of suspect vessels, which you know, goes on quite regularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it would be like tracking vessels which are involved in some criminal activity. That are suspected, certainly, yeah, yes, suspected mm -hmm. of carrying drugs. Um, so you do over the horizon tracking of mm -hmm. those. And do you have to do, does the Navy have to do a patrol of uh, shipping, uh, fishing activities? Yeah, that's one of its primary functions is the, the control of uh, fishing activities in our 200 mile exclusive economic zone, um, which is a huge area. Um, but, you know, modern technology helps to, to patrol effectively those areas now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, um, how did naval vessels and associated navigational technology evolve from the time when you joined the Navy in the 1970s to the time when you retired in uh, 2010? There's, there's no comparison. Um, so there was a big progress? Uh, a huge progress, both in, in you know, radar technology, in the introduction mm -hmm. of SATNAV, um, the introduction of uh, fire control systems for the weapons. The, you know, there's absolutely no comparison between the Navy of the 70s and the Navy of the, the current Navy. Mm -hmm. But like, can you list the main differences? Like, well, the technology, the engine technology, mm -hmm. the engine control technology, the weapons fire control systems, the navigational systems, the radar systems. The like I said, the introduction of SATNAV was a huge step forward. The introduction of electronic charts. Mm -hmm. um, they are all kind of leaps that that you make, and you obviously your training has to reflect mm -hmm. that as well. And I know like most of the vessels now, even like very big vessels, would be driven by a joystick. Was it the case in the 1970s or what? Oh, no, no, no. Use the steering it was wheel. the steering wheel and you're using, um, on the mice whippers, you're using telegraphs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the old controls. Um, it was a mechanical link down to the wheelhouse and then they would um, move the, the controls in the wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. The bridge and the wheelhouse were separate in, in the mice sweepers. Right, right. Okay, and were they connected by the radio link? No, no, it's a mechanical link, a wire link. Like a tube, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, is, it, is it still the case, or now it's all radio? Oh, no, no, it's, just, it's completely different now. You okay, know, it's so that's it's one virtually automated. Yeah. And in general, when was the Irish Navy set up? The Irish Navy um, morphed into, well, there was a Marine Coast Watching Service set up during the Second World War, which morphed into the Irish Naval Service, which became part of the Defence Forces in 1946. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was a very young Navy. So it could be like the youngest in the world, nearly? Uh, well, you know, as countries formed between mm -hmm. 1946 and now, they, they would develop navies. Uh, we were unusual, I suppose, in, in that as part of the treaty in 1921, one of the conditions was that the UK Royal Navy would still patrol our waters. Mm -hmm. So can, Ireland was under the protection of UK Navy? Its, it's waters were, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this this uh, is one of the treaty ports, Cork Harbour is one of the treaty ports. There were three, Cork Harbour, Bearhaven and Loch Swilly. Mm -hmm. where the British Navy maintained the presence. And according to your knowledge, like, are there any maritime traditions connected to the Navy that go back in time, which are the same now and in the 1970s and 1940s? Uh, someone said that we were too young to have traditions, we just have habits, but I suppose <laughs> we're, we're developing traditions. Uh, I suppose, you know, the, the last night of a patrol, patrol generally ended on a Friday, the last night uh, the ships are generally anchor and mm -hmm. it, Everybody has a steak supper. Um, it's quite traditional now to have the barbecues uh, once you're On offshore. The vessel. Yeah, yeah. Um, the you know the the traditions have to develop over a long period, mm -hmm. and 
you know, the, as society changes, the traditions change as well. Um, for instance, it was quite normal in the 70s that, you know, after your day's work, you would go to the, the wardroom and have a drink. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist anymore. People just don't drink. Um, You're not allowed to drink anymore. No, you, you can drink, but it's just, it's, it's not, societal changes have changed. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not acceptable now. Mm -hmm. So, naval vessels, they're not dry, but... They're not dry, it's but... It's not promoted. No, either. it's not. No. <laughs> and most, most people are quite happy with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I know, like, Irish research vessels, they're kind of dry, you're not allowed to yeah, drink. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if for nothing else, but for safety. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, um, it can be a dangerous enough environment, and you don't want uh, people with drink on board. But, like, before 1940s, did, did, did the naval base exist prior to this? Like, but was it part of the um, UK Navy, the Royal Navy? Yeah, the UK Navy were based here, um, mostly in the forts, Fort uh, Camden and Fort Mar, mm -hmm. and Spike Island were mm -hmm. their main. No, th this was a yacht, yacht club, is it? it no, no, this, they had the that Hall Bowling was where the Marines stayed, mm -hmm. and it was also a Vichling yard, and it was also quite a large hospital, um, particularly coming back from the West Indies. Mm -hmm. um, they would be um, brought to hospital here in, in Hall Bolan before being allowed back into UK mainland. Mm -hmm. And how would you summarize the role of the Irish Navy now, like in the state security, for example, or like what is the role? Well, of it's, the, a, it's the a component part of the defence forces, um, and it is, it's involved in aid to civil power. Civil power being the, the Gardaí. Mm -hmm. um, it's fair to say that most Navy people think they, they should have bigger numbers in the defence forces, which is. Uh, for historical reasons, um, very army heavy, um, where really the the work or, or the requirements exist with the air for air intercept and for sea patrol. Mm -hmm. Talking about traditions, for example, like if you think of the objects on the vessel, for example, like the, the bell, each 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 vessel would have a bell. Yeah? Does it go back in time into? Oh yeah, that goes like, that yeah? goes back to the sailing days. Yeah. Um, What's the meaning of the bell? Hmm? It marks the time for watches, mm -hmm. the change of watches. Um, so, and it also marks time. So that, that tradition still lives on. Um, the only time the bell is rung now is, believe it or not, is at midnight on New Year's Eve. Uh, the midnight, that, every midnight? No, oh, no midnight, oh, New Year's oh, Eve, oh, right, yeah, once a year. where the youngest person on the ship rings okay. the bell to, <laughs> to welcome in the new year. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, um, are there any tra other traditions, for example, related to w when you commission a new vessel, like w would a bottle of champagne be broken off the vessel, or is it more towards... North no, Canada? no. Um, it varies. When, when we commissioned the Orla and the Kira, um, they were commissioned by the then Taoiseach Charlie Hawhey, uh, there was no breaking of champagne. But in the newer bills, um, the Neve Rogin and, and the four P60 class, there was the, the traditional breaking of champagne. Mm -hmm. And, and the blessings, obviously. And here we're sitting in the National Maritime College of Ireland, NMCI, and I know that in the late 90s you were involved in actually setting up the college. So what was your personal involvement yeah. and your role in setting this kind of um, This college, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose the driver for it was, was the change of regulations and the standards of training and certification of watchkeepers, which meant a, a more revalidation of your watch keepers. The Navy obviously have to train as professional mariners and then they train as military. Mm -hmm. So Cork Institute of Technology is where the Merchant Navy training was taking place and obviously the naval base was where the um, naval training was taking place. So neither of us were large enough to justify a spend required to, to comply with STCW, particularly in the simulation area, mm -hmm. which is used for revalidation. So we got together and said, listen, we put in a joint bid um, to see could we get an NMCI, National Maritime College of Ireland, with, with the facilities we both required to conduct a, a professional training. CIT would do, use the facility to train their people, the Navy would use the facility to train their people. Yes. And there was a task force set up and the task force recommended, yes, we should go forward with a proposal. Um, the task force also said it is to be a public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. And proposal to the government. A proposal mm -hmm. to the government, yeah. So we had to work um, quite hard to get the proposal ready. Mm -hmm. And because it was a public-private partnership, you had to have your output specifications for each and every room mm -hmm. and facility in, in the college. 
and just took a lot of time um, because in a PPP you get what you want but if you don't include it you won't get it mm -hmm. so we were trying to work out all eventualities and um, the, the project team comprised of uh, Michael Delaney from CRT, he was the Vice President for External Affairs, uh, Donald Burke who was Head of the Nautical Studies Department and who was a Marine Engineer and myself as uh, Commandant of the Naval College and I would be an Operations Deck Officer. So you, you had the engineering side and you had the deck side and then we consulted with our people but um, the three of us just drove the project mm -hmm. um, because we had short timelines. Uh, we got it in and it sat with the Department of Finance for about seven months uh, which kind of worried which us. Which year was that? That was in 2000. So when the, the actual college, when actually you started building the college? The college started building in the early 2000s. Okay. Um, it opened uh, in late 2003, it was officially opened mm -hmm. in 2004. And does it still remain to be a partnership between Merchant and the Navy? Yeah, it's still a partnership between CIT and the Navy, mm -hmm. Cork Institute of Technology. But the college has developed obviously since 2004. Uh, technology has developed, so we're, we're always chasing new radars, new simulators. Um, and I suppose the other challenge was that at the time there, there was no kind of commercial arm to the college. Mm -hmm. So NMCI services were set up as a commercial arm. So they would run short courses for companies like Chevron. Mm -hmm. These are short revalidation courses. Yes. And then the big week card was that we didn't have a research and innovation department. So it was always intended to have a research and innovation department uh, from the onset but it just didn't happen because there was other priorities. So in 2011, CIT said they were going to set up a, a research and innovation uh, department um, and asked me would I like to come in as a consultant initially. And you're talking about the Halpin Centre? And that, that morphed then into the Halpin Centre. Okay, yeah. And uh, the Halpin Centre is self-funding, as, as kind of all research centres are, and as you know yourself from your time in... CMRC. That, um, so our, our main funding sources are H2020 and mm -hmm. Horizon Europe commencing in 2020, um, your team, European Maritime Fisheries Funds um, and Interregs. Mm -hmm. And on your website of the Halpin Centre I can see like your position is as, as principal investigator in maritime safety, security yeah. and defence operations. Can you elaborate on the nature of this work, like what are you actually contributing well, to the centre? Mm -hmm. Uh, there, there's projects that are relating to safety and security okay. and uh, we've been involved in those projects. We just finished a very large um, common information sharing environment project mm -hmm. which is information sharing between the different agencies. Mm -hmm. um, that, that just finished. Um, we're involved in one using unmanned vessels for search and rescue. Okay. Um, involved in the current one, it's, um, it's integrating commands. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, it's a very wide one. What is blue border? Blue border is sea border. Okay. Um, we were involved in interregs using um, drones and UAVs to um, take samples, um, particularly if uh, toxic samples, and to determine what, what was in the water mm -hmm. before you send people in. Um, and that was done in conjunction with. with um, well, I forget the name. That's actually was my other question, like how the technologies like drones change our reality because like in terms of aerial photography it's amazing what you can yeah, do even yeah, just from yeah. a mobile phone and I'm into kind of drone photography yeah, as yeah. well, like, but I guess like for security work it's yeah, also a great resource. Drones, but. obviously dr drones are coming, becoming very common, um, but they're, they're ideal for surveillance and mm -hmm. we've kind of utilised them, as I said earlier, for for taking water samples, mm -hmm. uh, you could put sensors in drones and fly them through a plume to see what's in the plume. So, you know, the use is only limited by your imagination in the use mm -hmm. of drone technology. And like, so you've been associated head of an MCI college for a few years in the beginning, yeah? Yeah, um, when it opened in 2004, I was the associate head. Um, obviously, you couldn't be a deputy head because um, you couldn't deputise for CIT, so mm -hmm. CIT were head of the college. The college is a constituent of College of CIT. That's where it sits in the educational sphere. Um, so, you know, well, I got on very well with Donald. We, we, we had worked together previously very hard for, for a number of years getting this project up and running. And um, when it opened, we, we, I was two years here as associate head just bedding it down. 
um, there was lots of you know teething problems. Mm -hmm. um, but you know we had prepared well from the navy side, so we stopped work in Hall Bowling on the Friday and, and commenced out here on the Monday, and you know it was seamless transition for from our part. And before the NFCI, were there any training facilities for the Irish Navy, or people had to go in to UK? Ah, uh, there, there was very poor training facilities, to be honest. Um, if the, the money was invested in ships as opposed to infrastructure ashore, okay. and that's where the priority was. So the, the training facilities were, were not up to scratch. And are you happy with the way the college develops and the way it turned out? Like, was it how you envisaged it? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's um, there's a very good design. There was three uh, consortia um, bid for the college, and um, the consortia that won, uh, headed by Bovis, um, had a very nice flow to the college. Um, obviously, as, as technology changes, um, you know, with paper charts behind us, but yeah. nobody uses paper charts anymore, so you have to uh, train electronic charts. The radars were an early notice fit, mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, they're cathode ray tubes, they're all radars now are flat screen, so you can see you're chasing technology. The, the biggest technology we have is assimilation, and um, in the PPP there is both software, software and hardware upgrades uh, factored in for the simulation, uh, because the simulation is improving all the time, and the refresh rate is improving, mm -hmm. so, and it's getting more realistic. And I suppose that has been the biggest change to training in that you can now train your ship's teams, your bridge teams, and your individual officers on simulation without the use of ships. And what aspects of NMCI were actually influenced by the Navy to facilitate training of the naval officers? Well, actually, it was joint because the, the training requirements for both the professional training requirements for the Navy and, and the Merchant Navy are very similar, okay. we both, except the Navy don't do cargo work. Mm -hmm. But we do, um, I suppose the biggest change was, was damage control firefighting where the Merchant Navy didn't do damage control, they did firefighting, but they've incorporated damage control firefighting into their training now using the facilities we have here in the NMCI. Mm -hmm. And if you were to address kind of young people who are thinking about joining the Navy, connecting their lives with the sea, what, what could you tell them? I would encourage them. Um, you get a lot of responsibility when you're at a very young age. You have plenty of variety. I know it's getting a bad press at the moment over paying conditions, but you know, that, that's cyclical. Um, Government departments are always out of step with the economy, and by the time they repair and, and improve the, the pay, the economy is after slowing down again, so the problem is nearly gone. But, you know, the variety and the training, the, the camaraderie that you get is, are, is excellent, and it's something that you bring with you all your life. And you, you have been very close to the sea and on the sea for, let's say, like around 50 years. Yeah. yeah? yeah. So you grew up near the sea, you served on the sea yeah. and near the sea, like in this, let's say, 50 or 40 years, have you noticed any changes towards like sea conditions or weather? Well, I, I suppose starting with Ring of Guinea, which was a very small country village at the time. Mm. In fact, I learned to swim where the entrance to the NMCI is now, because the water went in that far. This is all reclaimed land. Um, the, I, I suppose really at, in the last number of years with, with the rise in of temperature, particularly seawater temperature, you're noticing the frequency of gales to be much more. Um, and you're also so it's a fact, like you really noticed that you, oh, absolutely. the gales the, the more frequent than 30 years ago. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, without doubt. And also the fish stocks are changing. Uh, we're getting much more warm water fish and the cold water fish are moving further north. Mm -hmm. And that's again noticeable. So like in this context, what are you, what's your personal opinion about the ongoing talks about climate change? Is it like do you really see it happening through your kind of lifespan? Like it's, it's happening as we speak, Max. Yeah. Um, climate change is a factor that is, it's a ticking time bomb. You know, everybody says something should be done about it, but um, very few are doing anything about it. Um, so it, it's it's here. It's, it's a factor of life now. But like even like being out at sea, like. In 1970s and in the early 2000s, you're saying the main difference would be like the frequency of gales. The right? the absolutely, the frequency and of gales. And the intensity yeah. would be more or less the same, like. Uh, some are a bit more intense, but it's the frequency. Normally, you know, the seas would calm after a gale, but quite frequently now, uh, you would get one gale following another. Mm -hmm. So the seas are, are, aren't allowed to, to are build up all the time. Mm -hmm. And don't you think it could be a cyclical process that, for example, now the frequency increase, but then. Maybe in 20 years' time it's going to decrease again? Well, I'm not a scientist, Max, but um, 
you, you see what you see. Mm -hmm. No, that's very interesting what yeah. you said about like the frequency of yeah. the um, And in general, like if you were, um, if you could decide what you could change in this world, like what would you change to make this planet a better place? Oh, the, to make the planet a better place, we have to tackle global warming. That's, that's the one issue that is globally. Okay, Tom, and what's your knowledge about the shipbuilding in Ireland? Um, it, it's probably also connected to some locations in Cork Harbour. Yeah, it, it used to be the Barome Dockyard, um, which is just upriver from Holborn Naval Base, and they started building the, the Deirdre class, uh, Deirdre, Aoife, Emer and Ashling, and then they went on to, to build the Etna. So uh, actually, Irish naval vessels were built in Cork Harbour? They were built in Cork Harbour. Okay. Unfortunately, Etna was the last vessel to be built in Rome. Um, the, the shipbuilding industry wasn't become viable. The, the East Europeans and the Far Eastern Yards were cutting prices and they undercut all the bids. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, shipbuilding then um, had to move out of Ireland. And the last ba two batches of ships, the P-50 and the P-60 class, were built in Appledore in the UK. And you have lived most of your life uh, around Cork Harbour. And how did you notice, like, what was the influence of maritime kind of traditions on the way of life of local people? Uh, you know, um, there used to be an inshore fishing industry in the harbour, which is more or less gone. Um, the... I suppose the, the, the volume of, of yachting in the harbour has increased dramatically over the years. Um, the size of ships using the harbour and the, the turnaround time for the size of, of the ships is also quite noticeable now. Um, they have very little time in port, they have very quick turnaround. We, we know like that the first yacht club was in Halbolan where yeah. there is a naval base. So what's the history around that? Well, in, in, it was the Water Club of Cork which was formed in 1720. Mm -hmm. um, for racing, for sailing races between the, the officers of the UK who were based in the whole Bowling and Cork regions, and that morphed into the Royal Cork Yacht Club, uh, which then moved initially to Cove and finally to uh, Crosshaven, where it is located at the moment. So next year is, is a very important year for them because they celebrate the 300th anniversary mm -hmm. in 2020. And next year is also very important for the, the harbour as we celebrate European Maritime Day in Cork in 2020 so and of course we've Seafest so it's going to be a busy year uh, a busy maritime year next year mm -hmm. and do you plan to ever retire or would you <laughs> I know like you retired from the Navy but you continue working as a researcher in Hobart yeah, Centre yeah. well this, this is quite quite interesting work and I, I think whilst, whilst it's interesting you, I, I, I keep, keep with it um, when it ceases to be interesting um, that's when I will retire mm. Okay, thanks very much, Tom. Thank you, Max. Pleasure meeting you.